Assalamu alaikum. Would you all please stand for prayer and please assume a position of prayer most comfortable for you. Surely I am being turned to thee, O Allah, striving to be upright to him who has originated the heavens and the earth, thou mot from among the polytheists. Surely my prayer and my sacrifice, my life and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Nor so should has he, and this am I commanded, and I am of those who submit. O Allah, thou art the king. There is no God but thee. Thou art my Lord, and I am thy servant, and I have been greatly unjust to myself, and I confess my faults. And I ask protection against all of my faults. For none can grant protection against faults but thee. And guide me into the best of morals. For none can guide unto the best of morals but thee. And turn away from me the evil and indecent morals. For none can turn away from me the evil and indecent morals but thee. O Allah, make Muhammad successful. And make the true followers of Muhammad successful as thou did make Abraham. And the true followers of Abraham successful, for surely thou art praised and magnified in our midst. And O Allah, bless Muhammad, and bless the true followers of Muhammad, as thou did bless Abraham and the true followers of Abraham, for surely thou art praised and magnified in our midst. I mean. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger, and I greet you once again the greeting words of peace, as we say it in the Arabic language of Assalamu alaikum. For those that might not be familiar with those words, and those words are so popular, it might just be one or two. It simply means peace be unto you. On behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the brothers and sisters, the Nation of Islam here in Mosque Mariam. It's the headquarters, the flagship mosque of the Nation of Islam. And to all the other various mosques and the study groups in the various cities, states, across the United States, to those that are watching via internet across the world, Central and South America, Asia, Europe, our motherland of Africa, we welcome and thank each and every one of you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning for this powerful worship service. Give yourselves a round of applause. We all came to hear that good news. And as we anticipate that good news, it's time for us to start being good to ourselves and good to others like ourselves. We can't be good to anyone else until we start with self first. And one of the first ways we can be good to ourselves and others is to get to know your brother and sister. Turn to your left, turn to your right, turn to the brother and sister behind you. Give them the greeting words of peace and introduce yourself. Come later, come later. You, you, hey you. <laughs> you, <laughs> hey you. <laughs> Don't that feel better? We've been taught to hate ourselves that even when we sit next to each other, we're like. But Almighty God Allah wants us to love our brother and sister. That instead of sitting like this, we can sit like this. And no matter what kind of problems or issues we have, the answer to every prayer that we might have said this morning can be seated right next to us. And we can never access that prayer until we or answer to our prayer until we get to know one another once again we're all anticipating that good news when we watch news on the television it's information regarding events and happenings that you might not have heard and somebody is reporting to you but each of the following that will be coming up we will consider them student ministers or affiliates of this wide world broadcast that we're bringing you up-to-date information at the moment at the right time. 
because we're not in the days of predictions. We're not in the days of what happened yesterday, but when you follow the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you understand what happened then, why it happened then, what's happening now, and why it's happening now, but most importantly, you get that message of what you need to do and what I need to do today and for tomorrow. This is the good news, brothers and sisters, from our mosque in New York City, our affiliate there, please give a big warm round of applause for student minister Hafiz Muhammad. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, we refer to him as the great Mahdi, or the self-guided one, who came and raised up our divine leader, our divine teacher, and our most perfect guide, our exalted servant, the Messiah, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. We thank Allah and his Messiah for raising up and giving unto us the divine servant that is in our midst. We see him as the modern day Jesus that is in the midst of the people, battle, battling with the forces of the synagogue of Satan and the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the modern time for the freedom of the real children of Israel, which is the black man and woman of America. We speak of none other than the tried and tested servant that is in the front of the world today for you black men and women and for all people of righteousness. We speak of none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We greet you with the greeting words of peace on behalf of the believers and laborers of Moss Number 7 in New York City and Moss 7C in Brooklyn with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to Mas Mariam and to those listening by internet. We have another opportunity to bear witness to the light giving sun that is in your presence. We have another opportunity to be able to view and share the spirit of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. During the time and what must be done, he said that he would not come out again, that the job was left to us, but then he has come out with the fight to the synagogue of Satan, with the question is, who are the real children of Israel? And on June 26, he wasted no time, like a fighter getting in the ring, going at his opponent. He's not sitting on the ropes, he's not in the middle of the ring. He goes straight to the opponent and takes him with the jab and the uppercut and the right cross. He's got him on the ropes. And today he intends to come out with a knockout blow on part two, giving the proof that we are the children of Israel. So brothers and sisters, you rest assured you're in the right place at the right time here at Mas Mariam in New York City, in Philadelphia, in Atlanta, in London, in Jamaica, wherever you are on the webcast, you're in the right place. As we leave you, we want to remind you of this. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said to us that he was going to give to us the information that we would be able to come behind him and battle with the forces of Satan. He not only gave us volume one on the auction block, now he's given us volume two of how the, our black American economy has been given con gained control by the synagogue of Satan. Brothers and sisters, we have to stand with this light-giving son. You have to pick up the book and Ikra, read. It's not only good to visualize, but we have to read because the minister taught me one day, reading makes you wise, writing makes you exact. Well, it's time for us to become wise soldiers for Almighty God, Allah. So we ask all of you today to continue to hear Minister Farrakhan. Study what he has given. The book is no good unless you open the book up. The book has no value unless you take what is in the book and study it and have the proof yourself. Put on the whole arm of God and let us get behind the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as the light giving son so we can say to the family of us who are Muhammad that Muhammad got the devil on the run. Run, devil run. Let's continue to hear the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you as we greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Can we give Brother Hafiz another round of applause? That good news got everybody feeling good, doesn't it? All praise is due to Allah. Our next student minister, bringing that good news.
pioneer, friend, helper of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, companion of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, student of the greatest black man ever born, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was blessed to be able to witness, hear, and see him personally. And as Brother Hafiz said, with the fight left, right, left, where well, this brother helped to nurture the greatest boxer ever known, Muhammad Ali. This brother was in his corner teaching him Islam. This brother was right beside him, reminding me constantly of the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, if you don't know, now you will know. Brother Rahman Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness he came in the personage of the great, great, the great, great Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praises are due forever. He raised in our midst to me the greatest black man that have ever walked the planet Earth, and that man is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But he had to leave us for a while, but getting, he left, but he didn't leave because I feel like he's with me each and every day. For, especially when he gave me another precious gift in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> it's indeed a great honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to stand before the people of God and just say some of the few good things we know about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, about Minister Farrakhan, about Minister Ishmael, and the family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The most question is asked of me is, why was it set to be around the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? And that's a heavy question because you, not, you truthfully can't answer it in a few words. But so this will stop all from asking me that question any longer. It's like going to heaven to be around the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> and those of you who may have a little, a little doubt in him, don't doubt. The man had vision. He could see thousands of years ahead of time. He saw Minister Farrakhan long before Farrakhan ever recognized himself. He saw Ishmael and Rasu long before they even realized that they was men. Because I was sitting with him one day. I had plenty of opportunities to be with him because uh, I, I was one of his ministers. And I looked out for the farm for him. And Ishmael and uh, Rasu was playing over in the corner, little bitty fellas, about the biggest baby son you see walking around here. And he, the messenger told me, he said, you wait till they grow up. And now I've been blessed to see these young men grow up. And, and the sword they swing in the day against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's enemies. Now, many of you have heard me tell you about sitting with Donald Elijah Muhammad. He told me, he said, brother, I cracked Farrakhan. I don't know whether he shared this with other people or not, but I know he shared it with me. I believe if he had to share it with other people, they would be with Farrakhan today. So I said, yes, sir. Well, you and I drink coffee, talk about the Mars, talk about the farmland, talk about buying cattle, chickens, turkeys, eggs. We talk about everything. And then he said it again. He said, I cracked for it, son. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Got me wondering at that time whether he had cracked me or not. <laughs> 
so. About five more minutes passed by and I have a conversation. He said it for the third time. He said, I crack fire con, son. I said, yes, sir. But then I knew the problem book spoke of a book. In the problem book it says, Mr. E. Muhammad cracked an atom into 10 million parts. Now, I wasn't conscious of, I know that the problem book said something about a crack atom. We didn't have the problem book in the, like you have it today in this beautiful book. We had a little thin piece of book, the paper would almost tear up. It was so thin, you had to hold it together. You had to hold it with care, do you tie it, do it turn it in the page. So I rushed back home, I couldn't wait to get back to Atlanta to get that problem book to see what that crack atom was all about. And I picked it up. Said, Mr. E. Muhammad cracked an atom into 10 million parts and approximately 30 million black people was in America at that time. That's what the census say. I dropped the book. I said, God, Khan gonna get them all. I have to be frank and say what I said. Now, I didn't say minister for I, cause I, I, I said, Khan gonna get them all. I have to be truthful what I said, but he is minister Farrakhan. And I've been really, truly blessed because Farrakhan is the greatest preacher that ever came down the pike. And let me add, let me add, he's the most faithful servant uh, uh, from God. And see, and I've seen him come from, we may say, a little fella, uh, up through the ranks. Uh, and he came, used to come here in Chicago when he became minister, and we would practice martial arts. And he and I would end up together as partners doing the martial arts together. And I had a special love for him in the beginning, a long time ago. And for me to see him grow in his mission as he have grown, through the faith that he had in a God that he had never seen, but he saw Elijah. Huh? He saw Elijah. See, so he believed in what Elijah taught, and that's faith. Especially when the man is gone. Huh? to stand up and rebuild his teaching when he had all kind of enemies around him. Not just enemies in, the, in, the, in the, out of work. He had internal enemies. He had Muslim enemies. Uh, he had an orthodox world of Muslims against this movement that Farrakhan set out to rebuild. So he became the most faithful servant that God have ever had. And you and I can see from what God has been feeding him Huh? That he truly is a man from God. You shouldn't doubt. You should give it all. I did everything you can possible huh, to help Minister Farrakhan resurrect the dead here in America. And I'd like to conclude with this. Out of all, all the life a man could have, you mean you could have been born in 1860. We could have been born in 1900. But if you had not lived or lived in the time of Elijah, you have not lived. Because I, the greatest thing I can acclaim, I lived in the time of Elijah and Minister Farrakhan. I salam alaikum. One more time for Minister Rahman Muhammad. That good news is moving, isn't it? And to hear and see living history, to hear of a man that heard 
saw with his own eyes the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and is able to tell what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to him. Not only is it a blessing to him, but it's a blessing to each and every one of us that all of those that heard him can share a word with us that it would rain down blessings every time we hear of something the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. One more time for Minister Rahman Muhammad. I should say said and is saying that good news. Our next student minister, he's like a traveling affiliate. He brings that good news all across the United States. He goes into various cities telling them what's happening there and what happened at another place. He's giving information from the anchor desk, which is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And he's letting them know the problems that are going on and from the minister's mouth how to solve those very problems. He's a flamethrower. He's powerful. He's a bad man. Brothers and sisters out of Indianapolis, Student Minister Nuri Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. All praises are due to Allah. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who intervened in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, who raised up from the midst of us his messenger and Messiah, the greatest man that ever walked earth, other than God himself, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. We thank Allah for that Georgia-born God in our midst today. In this hour, we are eternally grateful to Allah for his divine reminder, his divine leader, his divine teacher and guide for us to get us back in the oneness with Allah. And that man today is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It's in their names that I greet you, my sisters and brothers, in the greeting words of peace, of alaikum. Yes, brothers and sisters, what a message that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan delivered a few weeks ago on exposing the identity of who the real children of Israel are. All praise is due to Allah for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah for this great man among us, this great champion among us. You know, according to the sociologists, not only do clothes follow trends, language follows trends, but also crimes follow trends. In each era of time, in each pocket of history, there are certain types of wrongs that are more popular than other types of wrongs. You might deal with carjacking one year. You might deal with drug dealing one year. Well, in this modern moment, the number one crime in America right now is identity theft. I said the number one crime is identity theft. Right now, 10 million Americans a year are victims of identity theft. Identity theft is whenever someone obtains your personal or financial information, uses your credit score or social security number to run up a tab in debt and move in the world in your name, creating problems for you, the real entity, and reaping a benefit from themselves who are the artificial entity. I'm saying that black people in America are the number one victims of identity theft by the so-called Jews and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan exposed that. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. How do you know that we victims of identity theft? According to the sociologists, there are symptoms that take place when one is a victim of identity theft. Victims lose on the average of $1,820 to $14,340 in wages when they are a victim of identity theft. Well, we didn't just lose no $14,000. The black man and woman of America lost our name, our culture, our land, our language, our religion, our moral ways, our folk ways, our norms, and we've lost our God. We've got that symptom. Victims of identity theft, according to the statistics, have a negative impact on their ability to find a job. Well, you know, white people don't have more money than we have because they're smarter than we are. 
they don't have more money than we, are, than we have because they worked harder than we worked. How can you outthink a pyramid builder? How can you outwork a slave? No, we are people that are on a real life monopoly board. But the difference between you and me and other nationalities is that we didn't come to the board with our two 500s, our two 100s, our four 56, 20s, 5, 10s, 5s, and 1s. We came to the game of life with no inheritance, no 40 acres and a mule. So when you move on the game of monopoly, you only have one or two choices. Either you buy or you rent. Well, if you don't have nothing as an inheritance to start off with, you can't even live on the board. So we start living outside the law, outside the board, and we end up going to jail, going directly to jail, and we don't pass, go and collect our $200. We are having a problem with this job situation. Would you agree? Another symptom of identity theft is that 70% of the victims have trouble getting rid of the negative information that have been put on their record. Have you and me not still struggled with the black versus the light, with short versus tall, with, with rich versus poor, with one on a small plantation versus one on the big plantation? Have we not been a people that have struggled with the transatlantic slave trade and the blow of slavery, suffering, and death that has had an impact on our psychology? Well, that is a sign that we as a people are a victim of identity theft. Would you agree? 40% of the victims experience stress in their family lives as a result of displaced anger and frustration over identity theft. Don't black people have a 75% divorce rate? And don't black people have a disease called ADD? I, I'm not talking about attention deficit disorder. I'm talking about absent daddy disorder in the black community. That's a sign that we are struggling and suffering from identity theft. 85% of the victims of identity theft have anger and rage. 40% feel victims feel inadequate. 60% are unprotected. All I'm saying is that we need a lawyer. What y'all think? Well, we thank a lot that we have an anointed attorney. We have a divine defender. And we have a lawyer from the Lord that is prosecuting our enemies on our behalf so we can get back what God has for us. And that man is Farrakhan. And we are those real children of Israel. So tune your ears up to, for to whom much is given. Much is required and he's going to give us that script. Thank you for listening. I greet you in peace. As-salamu alaykum. Oh, praise you to Allah. One more time for Brother Nuri Muhammad. As he went through each statistic of identity theft, most importantly, he told us who informed us that our identity had been stolen. They charge you a fee to get your identity back, but we can never repay God for informing us that we didn't know who we are. We can never thank God for informing us through his messenger of whose we are, what we should be, and what we're going to be. But what we can do is each of us can contribute right now to help the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan through our nickels, through our dimes, through our pennies, through our dollars, fives, and tens. We can show our love, our gratitude, and support that the feeling that you have right now, the good news that you're experiencing right now, the identity that you didn't know that was stolen, that you're experiencing all across the world, those that have felt a little bit of something knowing that the minister has blessed your life, each of us can give back to that cause that those that are out there on the street right now that don't have that feeling, they can experience that. So we'll ask our Ministry of Finance to quickly come forward that each of us right now take something out of your pocket that we can give to help the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. If our Ministry of Finance will now come down. Brothers and sisters, those that are listening across the country, those that, even those in your house, you can give too. You might not have the access to the mosque or study group, but there's a button right there on your screen that you can push where you can give to help the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Each of us that are sitting here, we've been affected by the words of the minister. 
Whether we know it or not, he's been a freedom fighter for us for over 50 years. Our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents, and some grandparents heard the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Our children and some of our great-grandchildren and some of our great-great-grandchildren are his listening to the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All of us, if we could, we should give a billion dollars and then some to help this ministry. But whatever you can give right now, please give it if they can pass a collection place, so if you all will begin to pass those right now so that we can help. If each of us could give whatever, whatever you can to help him, you know he's the baddest, boldest black man on the planet right now. You know he's fighting each and every day for our liberation. You know he's helping to free us, not only spiritually, but mentally and economically that we can now make decisions for ourselves that others have made for us. Why don't we do more to help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan? Those that have thousands of dollars, give that. Those that have millions of dollars, give that. Those that have just a dollar, give that. Those that don't have a dollar, if you have just a nickel, don't think, well, all I have is this. It's not enough. It's all that you have, then give it. Like the lady at the, at the well, she gave just two cents. And Jesus said that those two, two cents meant more than all of those that gave other monies because they gave what they could. She gave what she had. She gave her last pennies because she witnessed something that she had never saw before. She saw salvation in Jesus, that she would give her last monies to say, I can live in him. I'll give of that which give me sustenance because I see in him that which gives me life. All of us have been given life through the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We've been born again. We've experienced a new beginning. And we should give everything we have that not only to continue this feeling, but that each and every person that's not here. As Brother Rachman said, 10 million parts, 30 million parts, 100 million parts, billions of people need to experience the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as we're broadcasting live right now on the internet, we need to have a television station. We need to have a movie studio. We need to broadcast the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan 24 hours a day, on cable, on the radio, on internet cable, in the movies, in plays, wherever you go, you need to be able to see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and hear the greatest preacher that was ever born and the greatest representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Wouldn't it be beautiful to wake up and turn your TV and there's Minister Farrakhan? Wouldn't it be beautiful if you woke up at two in the morning and there's Minister Farrakhan? Wouldn't it be beautiful in the middle of romper room, boom, there's Minister Farrakhan saying something to your children? Wouldn't it be beautiful if one of his representatives at 24 hours a day, you could turn and get your spiritual feel. As you put gas in your car, you can get that high octane spiritual gas. But we can get that by giving your dimes, your quarters, and your nickels. How's everyone feeling? We're anticipating that good news. And as we move forward, in our good news, each person has brought us an aspect of how that news affects their life and how they have been taught and they report what they hear. And the words that they've gotten from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan applied to the condition of our people, how each of them have been able to awaken the masses. Well, we got another flamethrower coming up. But the Rockman kind of hinted and said when he was little, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, just wait till he grows up. Well, those of us here in Chicago, we know that each and every Sunday, we know what he was talking about. And those that are in the streets and those that might not know, in the schools, Brother Ishmael goes to the schools. He speaks to the grammar students. He speaks to the high schools. It might be one or two. He goes to the hospitals. It doesn't matter who, what you are. If you ask for spiritual counseling, if you ask for help, if you ask for mentoring, if you're asking for a good word, you call Brother Minister Ishmael Muhammad, he's going to say, Brother Jeffrey, let's go. That man is always willing to help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So as he comes forward to bring us the greatest news we can ever have, brothers and sisters, the student national assistant to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Brother Ishmael Muhammad. Allahu Akbar!
Allahu Akbar. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. We thank him for his merciful intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, who came 80 years ago on July 4th, the day of America's celebration of her independence, and he made himself known. We thank him for his wise choice of one from among us to be his messenger, his Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we are forever thankful to Almighty God Allah for the extension of his mercy and his grace by giving us one from himself, giving us one from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as an extension, the man that we have come out here this morning to hear from, to see, to witness. He is a divine leader, a divine teacher, a divine guide, and a warner to the nations of this earth. The man that I speak of is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I greet all of you with the greeting words of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, we have come to that point in our program for part two of the subject that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan delivered on the 26th of June in the city of Atlanta, entitled, Who Are the Real Children of Israel? He presented the question and he answered it, and I believe that we all bear witness and agree that we are, as black people in America, the real children of Israel. Today, the minister comes back to deliver part two of that subject and to present before the world the proof. As we prepare to receive him, know that there is no national black or white leader or international leader that has ever challenged the powers and forces of this planet in which we live. There is no president, no ruler, no prime minister that has ever challenged Jewish control and power but a black man that God has raised up from among a people who are considered no people at all. He has anointed him, prepared him, made him for the hour in which we live, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came among us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, we could never, ever thank him enough for his wise choice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as his messenger, Messiah, whom the world will soon come to know as the exalted Christ that all Christians have been looking for and the Mahdi that all the Muslims have been looking for. One anointed by God himself with the power now to crush the wicked and remove them and their civilization from our planet 
and replace it with that which we have prayed for, the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. I greet all of you, my dear and wonderful brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you, uh, Brother uh, Minister Ishmael and all of those who spoke before me for your words. Thanks to the FOI and MGT for your efforts in getting our people to come out to hear. Thank you to each and every one of you that have honored us by your presence. I pray to Almighty God, Allah, that he will guide the words of my mouth and also the meditation of my heart, that that which we speak in his name will be acceptable to him but also acceptable to the righteous wherever the righteous may be on our planet. Two weeks ago, yesterday, I delivered a message that Allah had put on my heart in Atlanta Georgia that asked the question, who are the real children of Israel? And I answered the question that it is you, the black people of America, the Western world, that are the people today of God's choice and the people to receive his promise that he made to Abraham that after his people would be in bondage in a strange land under a strange people for 400 long years he would not send a prophet he would come himself and he would raise from among us a dead people one that we would come to know as the first begotten of God from among a dead people and he would raise this one and make this one into himself and then give this one power to destroy this present world that is not fit for him to do it he said he will raise one from among the slaves and give him the power to free you, to deliver you, and to crush your enemies. That man of whom I speak is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, alive and well and in power. As you may know, I have a controversial relationship with the Jewish people. And they have made Louis Farrakhan the litmus test for any black man or woman who would aspire 
to citywide office, statewide office, or national office, that in order for any black man or woman to get the support that they would need to ascend to political power, they would have to denounce Louis Farrakhan. even down to our brother, President Barack Obama. When there was a controversy raging over statements made by his pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, a good man, a wonderful man. one of the greatest Christian theologians among us. He's of the school that is unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. And he used scripture to show and criticize America for America's evil done not only to us but her wicked policies that have subjugated and, and uh, robbed the masses of the people of the earth of their wealth. And for that, he was called an anti-Semite. And for that, his pastor, uh, as a pastor, the president was forced, if he wanted to be president, to disengage himself from a man who was his mentor. A man that he came to when he was conflicted about his identity with a white mother and a black father that abandoned him. And he found in Pastor Jeremiah E. Wright a mentor that never taught him to hate his mother or his mother's people and never taught him to speak ill of his African father who abandoned him, but taught him to respect the truth and to fight for justice, especially among those who are deprived. A Jewish reporter in the Washington Post, when Brother Barack was campaigning, wrote an article that said, we have to give him the Farrakhan litmus test. That was picked up by Mr. Abraham Foxman of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith. And while our brother was debating Hillary Clinton on NBC with Tim Russert, they asked him to denounce me and my support. I never endorsed brother in my Savior's Day speech a few days earlier, I just talked about the beauty of this man and that we should not look upon him as the black president and don't expect him to be the black president. But that man had a passion that he wanted to pull 
black and white together because that's his mom, that's his dad, that's America. He hated division. He wanted to be the American president. And so I said, if you want a black man to fight for black causes, look to us. Reverend Al Sharpton, Reverend Jackson, Farrakhan, NAACP, that's what we're set up for. But that man didn't become the CEO of the corporation called the United States of America to champion black causes. And it is unjust of him to think of him like that, although we should expect for him to use his bully pulpit to speak up for a people from whom he has come for the cause of justice. We expect him to open doors, but we have to be qualified to go in after he opens the door. Brother Barack did not want to condemn me. He hesitated. His campaign said, well, we condemn anti-Semitism wherever it is. And Bronfman said, he didn't go far enough. So they pushed him. And Hillary Clinton said, well, you have to just reject, see, force it. You got to use that term, we reject. So he said, well, then, all right, I reject his support. Well, all right, then. Now you can go on and be president and we'll back you but you must reject him even many black leaders were afraid to come close to me black preachers black people some of you hated me without a cause. I never did anything to you. I've always spoken for you and championed your cause. However, it is because of the power, influence, and money of the Jewish community that makes black people afraid to speak up for the hurt that we have received from the hands of some of their people, afraid to associate with those that they dislike? This is true. So, when I wrote a letter to Mr. Foxman and we put out two books, this one, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews Volume 1. The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 2, How Jews Gain Control of the Black American Economy. Wouldn't you like to know how? Wouldn't you like to understand 
why everybody else comes to America and goes to the front and we've been here longer than anyone else and are still so far behind? Don't you want to know what happened to you? After book one came out, I had a meeting with several Jewish rabbis, columnists at the home of a rabbi and one who was the former dean of rabbis in Chicago was present and also present was the great uh, columnist um, for the Chicago, uh, I think it's the Tribune, um, Cul Cul Cupsinet, and others. And at that meeting, we had dinner. It was very lovely. You know, I mean, everybody was very nice and I was nice too. <laughs> and I'm never, I'm never not nice. I treat everybody the way I want to be treated. <laughs> However, after dinner, or during dinner, pardon me, the rabbi pulled out of his pocket a piece of paper and said, well, of course, um, this is a love fest, but it's going to be tough love. And he said, uh, this is what we expect of you if you want to be our friend. Many people, when they get to a certain level and they get an offer that is difficult to refuse because it's accompanied by a threat, they usually cave in. So this offer of friendship had terms. And these are the terms. One. Farrakhan, we need to watch you and listen to you over a protracted period of time. In other words, I'm on trial. I mean, just think of the arrogance that a black man who speaks truth to power will be on trial for a protracted period of time before I can gain their friendship. The second term. Was. This book. The secret relationship between blacks and Jews is a great calumny against our people. We want you to stand up and denounce this book. Third, no man in history, no one in history, has ever been written of well who was an enemy of the Jewish people. You're very brilliant. You're a very gifted speaker. But if you want to be written of in history, 
well. You have to go down in history as the friend of the Jewish people. Now, Mr. Farrakhan, you can answer now or we can go upstairs and have some coffee and tea and you can answer then. I said, well, I said, let's go upstairs and have some coffee. It started the conversation with, you have your truth, and we have ours. I recorded that. So we had coffee. Are you prepared to answer now? I said, yes, I was prepared when you asked the question. I said, first, I would like to be your friend. I said, that's why I'm here. I said, but you wanted to watch me and listen to my words and follow my deeds for a protracted period of time. Well, I respectfully say to you, that your people have done more evil to mine than we have done to you. So maybe we need to watch you for a protracted period of time. Watch your words and your deeds before we even desire to be a friend. I want you to hear this. Second, you asked me to denounce this book. I said, I'll denounce it in the morning. Because if it's false, if it's all lies, I don't want falsehood and lies attached to my name. But we only quote it Jewish historians, scholars, and rabbis. So if you want me to denounce this book as a calumny against the Jewish people, since we quoted only your people, then you stand up tomorrow and denounce every scholar that we have quoted and say that they are anti-Semitic. I said, now, I'm here because I want to be your friend. But if being your friend means that I have to deny the truth, then yours is a friendship I don't need, and yours is a friendship I don't want. I said, now, you can gather all your forces. I want you to listen to me. This was spoken over 10 years ago with witnesses that are present here. I said, you can gather all your forces and come against me. I said, but as long as I stand on truth and stand with God, I'll be the winner. And I said, you can use your influence with the government and come against me. But as long as I stand on truth and stand with God, I'll be the winner over the government of the United States of America. When I walked out, I knew the stuff was on. They weren't going to back down from what they wanted from me. And I certainly was not going to capitulate. So I wrote in my letter to Mr. Foxman 
that rabbis presented me with terms that no self-respecting man would submit to. Get the final call of last week and read the letter. I told them that I, we have your history now. We've just put out part two. And with what we have in our hands, which will soon be in the hands of tens of thousands, I said we could charge you with being the most virulent anti-black group in the annals of our history. I didn't say we would, I said we could. I used the conditional tense. I said, and we could charge you with being the most deceitful person acting playing as our friend while you have been our worst enemy. Now those are strong words, but we presented the proof. Get me the other book, uh, Jews Selling Blacks. I don't have it up here. Thank you so much. Now this book, I'm telling you, thank you. It's $20, but those of you who are here and those of you who are watching by satellite, internet, this is an investment that is probably one of the greatest history lessons that you will ever have the privilege of getting because most of us who write, we write and we write, but we never go to the root of why we are in the condition that we're in. This book takes it to the root. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, no tree can die unless its root is exposed to the light. The root of your problem and mine and the world's problem is in this, these books. So those of you who are watching all over the world, you can get this book online. Get it, take your time. It's so scholarly done with nearly 2,000 footnotes that if you wanted to check what we are saying, you can go to the library and get the books. We cite the page that you can go and read it for yourself. We pit this against scholars all over the world and our scholars are prepared our historians are prepared to go up against the scholars of the world to prove and theologians that these that call us anti-Semitic are not Semitic at all. They have no connection whatsoever to the Holy Land. They are usurpers, land grabbers. We have you etymologically, anthropologically, historically, and genetically 
we can prove that you have no legitimate connection to that land. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to talk to you as a brother to a brother and sister, as a theologian to theologians, and as one who is under the scholarship of God and His Messiah. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I'll quote a word from him. He said, quote, What I have given you from my Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, is an invincible truth that if you stand on it, you cannot be defeated by any scholar or scientist of this world. Now, Jesus, Jesus said it like this. I thank thee, Father in heaven, for keeping these things from the wise and the prudent man and revealing them unto babes. We are the babes that have been blessed with supreme wisdom which we are about to share with you today. And I am so happy and thankful that the ears and the hearts of a beloved and most beautiful people that are destroyed not because we are black, but destroyed because we are ignorant. And that is why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now, you notice most Christian theologians, preachers, never talk about the reason why Jesus was crucified. You know, they tell you he was a good man, they tell you that he opened the eyes of the blind, made the deaf hear, cleansed the leper, the lame and the halt, raised the dead to life. But that wasn't the reason that he was crucified. That wasn't the reason that he was brought to court. That was not the reason. No. Imagine, one day Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey to the hosannas of the people. And a short while later, the people were saying, crucify him. What happened in that short space of time and these fickle people who saw him open the eyes of the blind, who saw him make the deaf hear, the dumb speak, who saw him raise the dead to life, who saw him beat the money changers out of the temple, who saw him do these wonderful things that his enemies said, he does this by the power of Beelzebub, the devil. 
And I noticed when Mr. Foxman, after reading our letter and receiving the book, the books, we sent them to all the top Jewish leaders. We sent them to President Barack Obama, to his Jewish advisors, Mr. Axelrod, Mr. Rahm Emanuel. We sent them to Tim Geithner. We sent them to Larry Summers, one of his economic advisors. We sent them to Ben Bernanke of the Federal Reserve. We sent these books to white folk of influence. And I said, now, just read it. Don't talk to me until after you've read it. We sent it to influential people in the media. We sent it to all the black leaders, to the black college presidents, to black scholars, to black entertainers. And some of you big shots, if you haven't got yours yet, look in the mail, it's coming. It's coming. Now, this man, said he, he didn't say nothing about the book his attack was on me well he used to assign us a little something in his lectures but now he took his whole subject on us he's virulently anti-semitic he's diabolical he's obsessive Oh, they went there with me. After I spoke in Atlanta for three days, you couldn't hear nothing on the news. And the latter part of the third day, they rose from the dead. And a letter came out to the news media. He ain't, he ain't answering me. That's why you should read the letter. Because it really asks for an answer. But instead of answering the thing that's in the book, he attacks me. And wonders why there are no black people out here that are attacking Farrakhan. I wouldn't do that today. That wouldn't be a wise thing to do. Why? Farrakhan not going to do nothing to you. But you see, this truth is so clear that if you fight for them against me that's revealing them and the truth of them, then you expose yourself. That you are the Tom. You huh, are the white man's tool. You are not affiliated with Jesus. You are of the synagogue of Satan and therefore will be dealt with by God. Now, I'm really trying to be calm, you know, because <laughs> I'm so fired up. <laughs> but listen, as I was sitting down with some of my research team and outlining what I wanted to say today, at the end of three hours of lining things up, I started speaking and I said, oh, God, thank you, Allah, because I knew something was coming to me 
that wasn't from me. And I said, oh, this is the way I'm going to begin. I said, well, you began a little while ago, didn't you? <laughs> that was like, you know, the prelude or the preface. Now we're going to open the book. Look. Jesus, after doing all this hard work, had to do something that would bring about his crucifixion. And what was it? It was his argument with the Jews of his day. Now, I have it here, um, and I'm going to quote it, and you can go back to your scriptures. Now Jesus in his argument, he knew what he was saying was going to bring something down on him. And he knew that what he was saying was going to bring something down on those who followed him. He knew that. Well, heck, if he knew it, why would he say something like that? See? Jesus knew that it was his crucifixion that would bring about the glorification of his father and himself. So he would tell his followers, look, I've got to suffer a few things. He said, but, but don't, don't let your heart be troubled over this and naturally Peter didn't understand poor fella you know when Jesus was telling how he had to suffer certain things Peter got upset wait a minute I'm, I'm paraphrasing now but Jesus all the great things that you have done why would you have to suffer these things and he, Peter rebuked Jesus, according to the book. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Here's his chief disciple who could not believe that this man who had worked all these wonderful miracles would in another instant appear helpless. Smitten, scourged. He couldn't take that kind of thought even. Betrayed by one of his disciples so between the time when the people were saying Hosanna and all the disciples were with him when they said crucify him the disciples were gone and at the cross none of them were there but John and his mother and Mary Magdalene Something about women. You know, when they love a man, they don't give a damn what comes down against him. They'll stand up for him because a woman knows a real man when she meets him. A woman knows a good man when she reads him and meets him. So we asked Jesus, you know, why would you do something that would bring about your crucifixion, your suffering, and the suffering of those who believed in you? Why, why would you do something like that? And it was because he was directed to do this by his father, because it was the way in which his father and he would be glorified. It was his argument with the Jewish people. 
So in the scriptures, that argument is written. And I would like to go over the argument that you think happened 2,000 years ago. And you don't have nobody among us that the Jews are condemning but Farrakhan. You don't have white people that will stand up strong. It's just Farrakhan. Well, these he's crazy. Would you be able to listen to me and see if I'm a nut? Well, if I'm not crazy and I'm speaking against those whom you know have the power, the influence, and the money to crush me and us. Why would you do it, Farrakhan? Greater love has no man that he would lay down his life for the sheep. See, the good shepherd is not a hireling. See, the good shepherd is not in this for some money. The good shepherd is from his father. And the father wanted to see his people delivered. So the good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep, but the hireling, he runs because he wasn't in it for the people. He was in it for himself. Now listen to the argument. Here is Jesus. Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him. Now there were some Jews that believed in Jesus. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the Jews answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How say you that we shall be made free? And Jesus answered them saying, Verily, verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. Well, if you had not been in hard bondage, but are you enslaved by sin, rebelliousness to God, doing what you and I please to do, but not submitting ourselves to God. So Jesus is saying the servant of sin abideth not in the house forever. That means there's coming a time when those who give their lives to rebellion to God will be removed from the planet. But the son who will submit himself to God and speak what God has commanded him and do what God has commanded him. He'll be in the house, meaning on the earth, forever. And that's why they tell you that if you believe in Jesus and follow him, you will have everlasting life doesn't mean that as physical beings we won't die 
but it means that what Jesus brings into existence will never die. And if you are a part of his kingdom, there's no such thing as death for you. So, Jesus said, well, you say you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Now, I want you to stay awake. And if your neighbor look like they sleep, just nudge them. This, this is too important. No, no, not that hard, not that hard. He said, now, my word has no place in you. Now, here's scholarly writing. We didn't write it. Jesus stands on it, speaks to it, and they say he's the liar. Nothing he says would they hear. Now look at this. He said, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Now there are two fathers here now. See, God is not the father of everybody. Come on now. We're going to church and we're going to school. We're going to mosque. We're going to synagogue. We're going to hear some truth. Look. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. See, now they're making a claim that Jesus is going to disprove. Um, Abraham is our father. Well, Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. The Quran says of Abraham, he was neither a Christian or a Jew. He was an upright man, and he was not of the polytheists. Now, Judaism didn't come into existence until after Abraham. Talk to me. So he was not a Jew. And he was in existence before Jesus. So you can't say he was a Christian. But yet he was the friend of God. And all the prophets referred back to Abraham. Well, don't, don't we want to be a friend of God? Don't we want God to be our friend? Well, if he was an upright man, then we can't say we're the friend of God if we are not striving to be upright. And that's why Muslims have to say this prayer. Surely, I have turned myself. Well, you can't turn nowhere by yourself. Surely I'm being turned to thee, O Allah, striving to be what? And I am not of. That's the prayer. And every Muslim has to say it. And every Christian should say listen 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 I'm, i'll be out you, you're gonna be fine in a minute jesus said but now you seek to kill me a man that has told you the truth which i have heard of god this abraham didn't do 
He said, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now wait, see, you can't come at them and they don't come back at you. So they knew something about Jesus. They knew something about the circumstances of his birth. So they threw it up in his face. Uh, you talking about who we are? Well, we know you are not no, nothing special. We are not born of fornication. Let's keep going. But Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. See? Master Farad raised the honorable Elijah Muhammad. But Elijah Muhammad sent me to you to complete his work. Now let's let's settle down because it's gonna get heavy. It's gonna get heavy. Now, Jesus asked, "Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word." Now Jesus gets bold. He said, "Ye talking to the Jews are of your father the devil." And the lust of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now that opens up a big, big theological problem. Because he said, you are of your father and the father of them, he said, was the devil. We better get into this right away. We gotta get into it right away. As my brother Jabril would say, right now. <laughs> oh. Oh, here it is. Now look at this. This brings us to the beginning of the enemy. I'm about to go there. In the book of Luke, Jesus said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So the father of this people were once in heaven. Then Isaiah the prophet says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which did's weaken the nations. I better read the whole thing because it's too powerful. Oh yeah, you, you scriptural scientists, just hang with me. Now, 
Look at what he says. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Could this have anything to do with America? The northeast corner of our planet? Let's see. Oh. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And Isaiah prophesies, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Is this the man? See, Satan ain't no spirit. Satan is a man. But what kind of a man? In the book of Revelation, the fifth angel sounded. He said, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. A star fell from heaven. And if you look further, in the scriptures, in the book of Thessalonians, the second chapter, I think it's around the ninth verse, it says to us, that day, what day? Shall not come. What day is that? The day of judgment will not come until there be a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Well, wait a minute. Calm yourself, Farrakhan. Just calm down. I'm just excited. Boy, we got a great father in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> Look. He says, This fellow was in heaven and fell out. Well, when you fall out of heaven, it's because you rebelled. In the Quran, it says, God made a man from dust. And said to the angels, submit to him. And all submitted except Iblis. Iblis is another name for a powerful angel who refused to obey God and bow down to a man that he made from dust. Check this out. Listen carefully now. Allah then asked Iblis, what is it that caused you not to submit when I 
commanded you. Ooh. Oh, brother, that's powerful. Here's God giving one of his servants a command and the servant is not going to do it. Well, you can't stay in the kingdom if you get a command from God and you don't want to follow. You got to go. Because the kingdom is not for rebels. The kingdom is not for hypocrites. The kingdom is for those who surrender their will to do the will of Allah. Listen to Iblis's answer. I'm made of fire. Well, he's made of dust. I am better than he. See, that's when you're starting to get sick when you take some quality that you have and make you to think you are better than somebody else. But look at the world that we live in. People have thought they were better just because they were white. Can I get a witness? And you have thought that you are not as good because what? You're black. And those of us who are light-skinned with curly hair and less negroid features have been made to believe by white people that we are better and we have been stupid enough to believe it because better means I'm closer to my former slave master so the white man is good because he's white and I must naturally be bad because I'm black so when somebody got curly hair you say he got good hair when did, did hair get a moral quality to it? It's hair. But since his hair is the object of our fascination, then a perm will do. Straighten that bad boy out. Give it a curl, give it a twist, give it something. Just don't let me stay kinky. That's a person that dislikes themselves. I'm better. Well, that takes us back to the origin of this world. Now, when I was in Atlanta, I talked about Jacob wrestling with the angel. And in his wrestling, with uh, this powerful one, he prevailed. And when he prevailed, he was given the name Israel. His name was changed from Jacob to Israel. Jacob goes back to a scientist from our people. Now this is going to get a little heavy, but I got to say it. So we in class, so we might as well hear it. You see these books? These are scriptures. A scripture as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and only he taught us is a part of the writing of something bigger. Listen. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that we, the original people of the earth, the black man, 
we write history and then walk into what we have written. We write our history in advance while mankind has to do it, then write it, and then mess it up if he don't like it. Rewrite it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, and there is no other teacher. Nobody taught this before he taught it. And today is the vindication of that holy man who walked among us like no black man has ever walked among us. Today is his day. He said, we write our history in advance and we calculate that history according to the circumference of our planet and the time it takes to make a complete change at the poles. This is science. So since the Earth is 24,896 miles in circumference, we write history to last for 25,000 years. So the wise scientist who wrote this cycle of history when they started writing they saw a man coming in the year 8,400 of our present cycle. And they saw this man coming, bringing in a vacuum in the history of the black man. When you have a vacuum, you don't have air and you don't have water. So if there's a vacuum in our history, somebody's going to live during that time and somebody will naturally die. Oh, you got to hear me. Because when you hear me today, you'll be hearing our Father, which certainly art in heaven. <laughs> you'll be hearing the one that you've been talking about, but never had a face on him. And the white man to deceive you made you believe that the Jesus of your book was a white man. The Bible don't teach that. But are you prepared to receive a savior that comes from you? That's difficult to ask of you because you don't think much of yourself. So anybody that comes up from you that God has favored, it's hard for you to believe that because you've been so thoroughly indoctrinated against yourself. He had hair like lamb's wool. Well, I guess there's no argument there. He had skin like burnished brass. His feet were like burnished brass. He's called the Ancient of Days. See? How old are you, black man? Huh? You have never even thought about it. You have never even given a thought to how old you are. No, I, I haven't thought about that. Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the sun, moon, and star don't record your beginning. No rocks, no stones record your beginning. 
See, that's why Jesus could say of Abraham, when they said, you know, about Abraham, Jesus said, well, before Abraham, I was. <laughs> Abraham was a tough man. But that man talking about before Abraham, I was, he's the toughest of them all. He didn't say, I had a, he said, I am Alpha. Not that he had a beginning, we don't know when that beginning was, but he's the beginning of everything else. I am Alpha, the beginning, and I am Omega. I'm the beginning of things, and I'm the ending of things. So in this vacuum in our history, a man named Yaqub would come. He's a black man just like us. They said he's a wicked scientist. No, he was a scientist. Not a wicked man, a scientist. When he was six years old, they saw him coming. And he would be in the year 8,400, and the civilization that he would bring in would last for 6,000 years. That would bring us to the 15,000 year in our calendar history, leaving 10 more thousand to go. But the scientists couldn't see the last 10,000 years. Because the one that would come at the end of the 6,000, his, his wisdom was so bright till it blinded the scientists. All they could see was him. So they said, seal up the book and write no more, for it has not entered into the heart of a man to perceive what lies beyond this world. It hasn't entered his mind, not even a thought. So both the Bible and the Quran end. Listen to me good. End with the coming in of a new world. None of these books admit you in. These books prepare you for something better than what you're living in right now. Now let's go to Jacob or Yaku. Oh man, I, it's gonna take me a few minutes. <laughs> now a, a wonderful person wrote me and told me that I was mistaken about uh, Israel and that it doesn't mention wrestling, but at a certain point it mentions that he prevailed and therefore was called Israel, meaning he prevailed. I said, brother, you are right. But what did he prevail over? I have a definition for the word prevail. <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters, I... I wish you'd just be patient with me a little while. See, this man, Yaqub, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, finished all the schools of his day in Arabia. And when you th think of Arabs, you think of white-looking people. Sorry. The original people of that area were not white. The Holy Land was all black. The original Hebrews a black people. The Semitic people a black people. 
Well, wait a minute. Semitic people come from one of the sons of Noah called Shem. Don't put that on me. Before there was a Noah, we were. Before there was a Ham, we were. Before there was a Shem, we were. We are the father and the mother of all the races that live on our planet. There's not one that we didn't bring into existence. Not one. I want you to follow me. When Brother Stokely Carmichael, now known as Kwame Ture, raised the cry of black power, but couldn't define it. Elijah Muhammad wrote an article describing black power. Listen to what he said. He said it was the power of the black man who looked in the life germ of black people and saw another people right up inside of us that didn't have form nor expression. But Yaku separated the brown germ from the black germ. And he prevailed when he was able to bring out of us what was in his mind and produce a new people that had never been on our planet before. This is the beginning of the white race, the Caucasian people. This is not racism. It's absolute truth. Could you tell me something? Have you ever watched your babies when they learn how to crawl? What do they do? They discover things. They crawl about. Ooh, look, a ball, a stove. But they're discovering because it's a new world to them. So it is with the white man. He's a new man. He's not a native of any part of our planet. You never find white people calling themselves the native. They're not the native African, but they live there. They're not the native of the Middle East, but they live there. They're not even the native Europeans, but they live there. You certainly know that they, when they came here, they discovered some people already here. Well, the people that they discovered knew where they were. Everywhere they went, they found some member of the original people of our planet having been there before they were even a thought. I want you to hear me. It took, it took um, time to graft the white man out of the black man. Now listen to the law that produced them. The law was you have to kill the darker, save the lighter, and marry the lighter on to the lighter, and after 200 years, you would have a brown people and some of them were sent by black power yeah. off of the island of Pilon or Patmos that you read in the book of Revelations. And they went up into Asia, yeah. the island of Nippon. Yeah. But there were people already there called the Ainu people. After another 200 years, 
killing the darker, saving the lighter, marrying the lighter on to the lighter, a yellow people were produced. And some of them left the island and were sent up into what you call China today. But there's some dark people up there. You didn't hear me, did you? And after 600 years, a new people, a white people. But what produced them was murder and lies. So when Jesus said, I know you, you are of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. See, lies were going on. Murder was going on. So a man would be coming that it's easy to lie and easy to kill. I beheld your father when he fell from heaven like lightning. He was an original black man. He is not a devil, but he's the Satan that brought the devil into existence. And he taught the Caucasian a system of tricks and lies by which he could master the black people of our planet until the coming of God. See, you do the deeds of your father. He was a liar. He was a murderer. What have we experienced? See, you got to talk to me today. Like I'm talking to you. What have you experienced from your enemy? What did he tell you about yourself? He found you in Africa, swinging in trees, with bones in your noses. You never did nothing. You ought to thank God for the day that we brought you all out of Africa and brought you to America and civilized you. But how? How could we have been in Africa doing nothing when it was our artisans and craftsmen that built the great mansions in the South. It was our artisans and craftsmen. Even though our women were in crocus sacks, they taught the white woman how to cook. They were seamstresses and made the white woman's clothes. She didn't know how to sew. Were no, you were no people like that. You've become that. You are the master builders. You Masons. I don't want to ask you to raise your hand if you're a Mason or a Shriner, but I tell you, you don't have it. Why you think you're in a segregated uh, temple? Because they're teaching something where they are that you're not supposed to get. But if you come here, we'll give it all to you. Because we have not 33 degrees. We have 90 degrees and looking for 360. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have studied geometry? Oh, yeah, okay. Now, when you're a mason, you have the square and the compass. You're supposed to be a builder. A builder. If I got 33 degrees of a circle of 360, I'm crawling. Listen, 
the highest degree that any Shriner will get is 33 degrees. Well, shouldn't that make you understand that you're not in something that you belong in? If all you can get is 33 degrees, then you're crawling. Abraham was an upright man. And you can't be upright until you're standing perpendicular to the earth with 90 degrees of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. All right. Now, Yaqub or Jacob prevailed. He brought out of the black man a new man, gave him form and expression, and taught him a system of tricks and lies by which he could master the original people of the earth until the coming of God. Follow this. The Quran says, God and the devil having a talk And the devil says to God, respite me till the day when they are raised. The devil is asking for a delay of his judgment until some people that were down would be raised. And when God said, surely you are of the respited ones. Why did you give him a respite? Because I gave him 6,000 years to rule. And my coming is not until after the working of Satan. So, Satan says, or the devil, well, I'm going to come after them in your straight path. I'm going to make them all deviate. See, this devil has gotten right up into the leadership of Christianity, the leadership of Islam, the leadership of Judaism. Follow what I'm saying now. That's why the whole house of religion has to be cleansed. And that's why the scripture said there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and the former things are going to pass away because Satan has gotten control of religion. Now wait, has Satan gotten control of religion? We Muslims, but we're more ritualistic than engaged in righteous conduct. Changing realities. Going to mosque don't make you holy. <laughs> Saying your five prayers doesn't make you holy. Those are starting points for us. But if you can just go to the mosque and say your prayers, practice fasting during the month of Ramadan, and do the good that you know to do. You're not changing the condition of the reality of the world. You're just a religious person. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, a learned man, one learned man, is harder on the devil than a thousand ignorant worshipers. Well, the devil seems to be having a good time, don't he? He didn't got the religion of Islam messed up. We're just killing each other, having a good time. Christians, how, how are you? How are you? Claiming Jesus Christ. One of you is a Baptist. The next one is a Methodist. The next one is the Church of God in Christ. The next one is a Sanctified. The next one is a Presbyterian. The next one is a Methodist. And we're all arguing which one is better. See, that, ain't, that don't belong to God. Satan got the house of God divided.
Now, brothers, I want you to put up the Star of David. Oh, Lord. I know y'all. Oh, uh, that's all I know how to do, brothers. Make it plain. <laughs> Look, you got it up on the screen? Not yet. Oh, they fell asleep. Uh, Okay, now I'm going to step over to the board, if you don't mind. <laughs> Give me a microphone, please. Ready, sir. Is it getting a bit much for you? No. Are you sure? Now this Star of David is a very beautiful symbol. Look at it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six sides. Six angles. One, two, three, four, five, six. And each angle in an equilateral triangle is how many degrees? degrees. Say it loud. Degrees. Well, you have six, six, and six. So the Bible says, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 600 Three score and six. Let's go to the board. Why two triangles? One right side up, one upside down. Now, I want you to put uh, the body of a human being and put the star of David across his body. Oh, we, we, we're in school today. Okay, check it out. See, when Muslims pray, we start here. The right hand clasped over the left and around the midsection. This midsection represents your appetites. When you are enlightened, when your head is filled with spiritual knowledge, then your heart, your lungs, your head reflects spiritual wisdom. Jesus said, and the apostles said, the fruit of a spiritual mind is love, peace, happiness, joy, harmony, concord, agreement. But the fruit of a carnal mind is envy, jealousy, enmity, hatred, strife, murder, war. Now, as long as this triangle controls this one, we are right. But whenever we lose this one, we get to this one. Put the downspout triangle up just the one going down you notice where the point is right no no hold, hold it there a minute yeah 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 see sisters <laughs> that's all I know to do look sisters 
See, you don't design your clothes. You let a freak design your clothes and you step into what the freaks designed. You used to have a hairstyle. You cut your hair and your hair would go down into a V-neck. And the V-neck reminds you of this area of yourself. And you didn't hear me. See, this is why you like to put on these tight pants. Because the tight pants expose the V. Did I say something wrong? It's the same with us men. You got on these tight pants with the outline of your penis. The sisters walking, they looking. That brother's heavily endowed. And when the brothers look at you, see, this is your breast. So let's reveal more of it. Let's show our cleavage. All of us as men, we were babies at one time. So we know what that means. So when the white man wants to excite a man, what does he do? See, it's boobs and butt. You the boob and butt generation. And now you really believe that booty is beauty. So you go even and buy something that pumps it up. Because you know gravity got a hold of it, breaking it down, so. Poor brother, you so messed up. <laughs> Today in the water, they're messing us up so bad, men can't have natural erections. But don't worry, don't worry. We got a pill for you. Take that pill. And if it messes you up more than three days, you're still with an erection, you better call the doctor. <laughs> now you're losing size. But don't worry, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we got a pill for that too. <laughs> Millions of people across the planet are buying Extends. <laughs> Bigger is better. Oh, don't worry, sisters, if you're losing your libido, we have a female Viagra. Where's your head? Well, it ain't here. We fighting in the house. We're fighting each other. We don't have peace. Not in the mosque, not in the church, not in the synagogue. We join organizations hoping to be better and we're still non-productive. Come on. We want peace, but we don't have it. It's because spiritually, we are dead. We're very religious. We're full of rituals, but we are spiritually dead. This symbol was not used during the time of Moses and the early Israelite prophets. This is a symbol that is recently used for so-called Jews and Zionists. 
See, they know their number. When I was in show business, it was a man who used to sing a song, they wrote it. It goes, I'm gonna laugh instead of cry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill my cup until my number's up. I'm gonna live, live, live until I die. See, white folks write stuff like that because they know there's an end to their world. Put back up the six, the six, uh, uh, the double triangle, please. Thank you. Now, six sides. I'm giving you 6,000 years to rule. 60,000 people were used to make the Caucasian from the original man, and he was given 600, uh, I'm sorry, 600 years to produce him. So you have three sixes here, okay? And the book says, count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. 600, three score and six. But in the Genesis, you don't find the beast or the dragon, you find a serpent. A snake that's more subtle than any beast of the field. But by the time the serpent marches through the scripture from Genesis, by the time it gets to Revelation, it's a dragon. A dragon. Making war against a woman that was pregnant with a man-child that was destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now, how does this argument with today's Jews stack up, tally with what's in your scripture of the argument of Jesus with the Jews of his day? and we can begin to go home. Come on, take this. Now, brothers, sisters, look at this. Here, Paul is talking in his writings about Jews and Gentiles. See, are you ready for this? If we say Israel represents the whole of the white race, then where does Jew come in? Israel was with Jacob or Yaqub in the beginning. They traced Judaism to Judah and so you have Jews coming into existence far after Abraham the honorable Elijah Muhammad said Jesus was not a Jew he was condemning the Jews he wasn't condemning himself he just was not that now somebody has been playing a robe. Now you go home tonight, get your Bible, look at Revelation 2 and 9. It says, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty. He's, John is talking to the churches. It's you. Look. I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty. 
But parenthetically it says, but you are rich. Wow. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Ooh, doctor. That's rough. It's in your Bible. You don't find no preachers preaching that. Because it becomes offensive to some. Now, Jews are very sensitive people. If you even look like you're going to criticize them, they get very defensive. And you could say they're defensive because of what they suffered in Europe. That may be one reason, but the main reason is, see, when somebody has lied and stolen your birthright, the one thing they fear is not your guns, because they got some bigger. They don't fear your so-called scholarship, because they arranged your education and they never taught you anything that would allow you to upset their rule. But what they fear most is the truth. And as long as you know the truth, but are afraid to speak it, the truth will never set the people free. So in the Quran, it talks about a messenger and it says O messenger deliver the message and if thou do it not thou hast not delivered the message but if you do it surely I will protect you from men now, to deliver the message is going to take courage. To deliver the message that exposes Satan, you're going to have to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you're going to have to love your people as you love yourself to be willing to suffer to free them from the grip of Satan who can masquerade as an angel of light and deceived the entire world. Now, dear brothers and sisters, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, we should observe the white man Observe him because he is successful and he makes no excuses for his failures. They work hard and they work together for the common good. So he said, study the white man. How many of us have made a serious study of white people to see why they are successful and why have we been short in success? Of all the white people that we should study, the most successful of all the people on this earth are the Jewish people. Listen to me good now. There are no people on this earth more successful than the Jewish people. I don't think there are any people on this earth more wise than the Jewish people. The Quran does not permit Muslims to lump all Jews together in one bag. 
we would be unjust. For the Quran says, those who are Jews, those who are Sabians, those who are Christians, whoever believes in Allah in the last day and does good, they shall have no fear nor shall they grieve. So no true Muslim would hate a Christian or hate a Jew that's trying to practice. If you're a Christian and you're trying to practice the teachings of Jesus, another righteous person could not hate you but love you and admire you. And if you are a Jew and you're practicing the teachings of the prophets, there's no Muslim that could hate you and want to kill you or fight you or destroy you. But listen to this. When God reveals truth that was not in the world before, how you use it determines who you are. If you use the wisdom of God in accordance with God's will, you are the righteous. But if you use the wisdom of God for vain material purposes denying God, then you are the wicked. And the chief of wickedness is Satan himself. So in the book of Revelations, it again in 3 and 9 it comes back again with that theme behold I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee God is telling them, you can do what you want, but before it's over, I'm going to make you come and bow to the feet of my servant because it's only through him that you will escape the destruction that is now coming upon America and the world of evil. Now, look. I think we can wrap this up now. What time is it? Oh, my goodness. I have so much to tell you. I just can't tell it all. But I want us to see how successful Jewish people are. Would you just like to take a peep at them and why we should study them as the most successful and learn how they have worked hard in a collective manner and have become the powerful people that they are? Don't you want to rise from the condition that you're in? Look, as a group, I'm quoting Jews now about themselves. As a group, Jews are the most successful in terms of income and wealth, and they have reached the echelons, the highest echelons of power in every field transportation, distribution, publication, movies, theater, art, science, medicine, law, architecture, astronomy, archaeology, anthropology. But all of this was developed through their mastery of trade and commerce. It is their success in trade that fueled all 
the other areas of Jewish life. David Brooks of the New York Times, January 12, 2010, wrote, quote, Jews are a famously accomplished group. They make up two-tenths of one percent of the world population, but they're 54 percent of the world chess champions, 27 percent of the Nobel Physics Laureates, and 31 percent of the Medicine Laureates. Jews make up 2% of the United States population, but 21% of the Ivy League student bodies. 26% of the Kennedy Center honorees, 37% of the Academy Award winning directors, 38% of those on the recent Business Week list of leading philanthropists. 51% of the Pulitzer Prize winners for non-function, non-fiction, pardon me. Two-tenths of one percent of the world. But look at where they've reached. Don't you want to study them? You need to get the book. See how you were undone and see how they we're done. We got to do the same thing only for righteousness and not for evil because God is closing down their world. But if you study how they were successful and use the great principles that they used for righteousness sake, we as a people can rise. Did you know that in 1922, 1926 they were talking about setting up Howard University and in Congress they were arguing over what Howard was going to teach right, right. and listen to this white folks in Congress said well we don't know why we're setting up this college for black people because we're never going to teach them one the science of business two the science of warfare. Three, the science of, med uh, of uh, mating. 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 What that got to do with it? Have you noticed that you can go into business But most of you that get an MBA or master's in business administration, you're working for white people, but you can't make a business for yourself. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that even our successful businessmen, and in this city of Chicago, we had a black businessman named Mr. Johnson, Ultra Sheen. You remember him? He had 750 black people working for him. Where's his business now? It's gone. Look at Motown. Black man started from the ground up, got it to a certain point. Who owns Motown now? B-E-T started by a black man developed by a black man now owned by Jews what offer did they give you that you couldn't refuse see you think about business but business in this world is warfare and if you don't know the science of warfare, you make business, but you won't know how to protect what you build. And what is the science of mating? See, 
Now, all of you know this in breeding dogs, in breeding horses. When they send a horse out to stud, some of these great champion horses, do you know what they pay for his sperm? Are you listening? They pay thousands upon thousands of dollars just for the sperm. Well, in the house of Rothschild, it, did you know how they married throughout Europe? This family married with that family, extending the house, building their businesses so that they're the richest house on earth. We don't do that. You go out to the bar room. You meet somebody in the crack house. Or you partying. See, white folk are not like that, the big ones. They arrange meetings where this one will mate with that one and extend the house fortunes. You think that's a crime? Oh no, I have to pick the one I love. Oh. Look, look at you, look at your condition. What you pick is, well, poor things. That's a science that we have to learn how to match this one with that one and extend the growth, the development. Did you know that Elijah Muhammad practiced that? I got to say it. In 1974, my brother, who was a captain of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and a minister also. We were together when we went into the palace and we were looking at the beauty of his home that he had built, but he knew he wasn't going to be in that house, but for a very short time. And in October of 1974, he invited me up into his bedroom. I'd never been in his bedroom before. And my daughter, Maria, and my daughter, Donna, were betrothed to his grandson and his nephew. He wanted the Muhammad and the Farrakhan family to merge because he saw something in the seed of Farrakhan and in his own seed that would strengthen the nation's prospects for the future. I didn't understand what he was doing. I mean, I didn't know, you know, a wise man does things. Foolish people say, oh, oh, yeah. Well, that's the way I was. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, that's nice. But he knew what he was doing. The Muhammad family is a great family. And none of us are capable of judging that family. Because the only reason we are here is because they exist. And to honor them and respect them and to love them for being the foundation that we are standing on today. But look, here's Ishmael Muhammad. Come on out here, uh, Ishmael. This is one of the sons of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. A few weeks ago, his other son, 
Abdul Yassin Muhammad spoke here. Rasul Muhammad is his student minister in Detroit in Miami. And Kamal Muhammad married uh, my daughter and my son Joshua married the daughter of Elijah Muhammad. And he told me how the children would be in the future. Now, this is a wise man planning for the future. Look at, look at these beautiful girls over here. Sisters, don't just throw yourself away to any man. You are more valuable than that. And don't feel bad, you know, if your father, I mean, in a real Islamic sense, sees some good Muslim brother somewhere and brings him home to meet you. He might not be as handsome as you would like, But if he got the right stuff, that's how white folk have expanded and grown and had big, strong families. I think Hillary Rodham Clinton is a part of, if you trace her lineage, she go right back to the Rothschilds. She's a, her, his, her daughter is about to marry a Jewish young man. This is no accident. She ain't bringing him or her to some little jive dude. That man got some stuff. Is it making sense? Yes, well, Ishmael, I guess uh, I thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family. And uh, I want to say this to my family that is here. See, I loved Elijah Muhammad so much that I didn't see you as I should have. Because there was no family more important than him and his family. So I neglected mine to a degree for his. He told me, don't worry about my family. Just focus on the mission and Allah will take care of your children, your family. And I can say with my children present, that Allah has indeed taken care of us. But how else? Could I grow into him if I didn't love him more than life itself? So Farrakhan died in order for him to live in me. And he told me one day, when you find out who you are, you'll have to struggle to hold yourself down. Well, now I've come into the knowledge of who I am. Yes, <laughs> and if I am who he told me I am, then my children are more than what I thought they were. That's right. oh, wait, wait, wait. As I come more into the knowledge of myself, I not only honor and respect Muhammad and his family, but I honor and respect the children that I 
and Mother Khadija and my extended family have brought into this world. Great children with a great future. But remember this, whenever God chooses you, he says this, my covenant is not with the wrongdoers. So in order for us to avail ourselves as a son of Elijah Muhammad or son or daughter of Louis Farrakhan, we must come away from wrongdoing and be worthy of the great promise of God. Because this wouldn't be here now if you all didn't suffer and sacrifice to help me get this up again. So you're worthy of whatever God will bless you with, but we must forsake wrongdoing and come into the favor of God. And I want to say to all of you that are present, look at your beautiful children. Look at the babies that you're bringing on this planet that may be some of our grandchildren. Look how smart they are. Look how wise and alert they are. This is God's blessing on your womb because you are going to be the future rulers. And we may not be that, but our children will and our grandchildren will. But we've got to make the sacrifice now to prepare the way for that great generation that's coming up from our loins. Now. Okay. Can I have 15 more minutes? You know, uh, Simon Wolf was the president of B'nai B'rith Jewish organization in 1926. And this is what he wrote. Listen, we all know that the first bankers of the world, the Rothschilds, are Jews. We know they control not only the money market, but also the political destiny of the European world. Even our loans were taken principally by Jews. But mercantile enterprises owe a vast debt to the Jew. You need but look at the streets of the principal cities of the world on Jewish holidays, and you will at once see that trade is in mourning. The busy hum is hushed. Everything is languid, the active brain, the quick, nervous decision, the daring yet cautious speculator is absent. Look at Spain and Ireland and then at England, France, Germany, and the United States. And when it's a Jewish holiday, everything gets quiet. Why? Because they are the principal business people of the world. Isn't that something to admire? You know, what I'm saying to you today is not for you to hate Jewish people. That would be beneath you. Because whatever they did, it was by order of a power bigger than they and bigger than we. God is the author of our suffering, but he used these people to train us up, to burn us in the fire of affliction, in the furnace of affliction, that we could come out as pure gold to be the standard of value of every nation on our planet. <laughs> if 
few more minutes. Today, Jews are 20% of the nation's doctors and lawyers. Book publishers, Simon & Schuster, Knopf and Random House are Jewish, CBS and NBC are Jewish, half of New York's theatrical producers were Jews, and they exert complete control over the production of movies. Half the opinion-making and taste influential paraphernalia in America is in Jewish hands. Can you deny that? How many members are there of the Supreme Court? How many? Do you agree? Is it nine? Yes, it is nine. But guess what? Of the nine, two are Jewish. Stephen G. Breyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and if Elena Kagan is elected of the nine, 33 and a third percent of the Supreme Court will be Jewish. Pat Buchanan, uh, the ADL called him a recidivist anti-Semite. But he's arguing, man, what is this? What about, what about the idea of diversity? See, when Congress got a vote, Congress is so wrapped up and under the thumb of Jewish control and power. You don't even have a congressman that will vote hardly against anything that deals with Israel in a negative way. That's just not going to happen. All right. Well, what about gangsters? Now, you call yourself a gangster. I am a gangster disciple. Yeah, yeah, but you're not a good disciple of the real gangsters. Because the real gangsters have taken a world. And we hustling drugs on a corner and killing one another, but we are gangsters? That's punk stuff. Let me show you what gangster is. Watch this. Robert A. Rockaway, senior lecturer at Tel Aviv University in Israel, discusses the era when all types of illicit drugs were dumped almost exclusively in black ghettos. Listen to the quote. After the First World War, Jewish gangsters became major figures in the American underworld and played prominent roles in the creation and extension of organized crime in the United States. During Prohibition, 50% of the leading bootleggers were Jews. And Jewish criminals financed and directed much of the nation's narcotics traffic. Jews also dominated illicit activities in a number of America's largest cities, including Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Minneapolis, New York, and Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a gangster, but you're a sharecropper. You still on a plantation. See. The hood is a plantation now. Yeah. And you gangbangers are the plantation overlords. You done scared the hell out of everybody on the plantation. Because, you know, you're running things with your guns and your, you know, you're killing one another and scaring the hell out of others. And, you, you know, you don't own no ships, so you ain't bringing no drugs in. 
You don't own any planes. You ain't bringing no drugs in. It just comes into your community because you got a share crop. Kill your people and make a profit because they didn't close down business in the black community. So the only place that a poor person can make some money, well, you can get a job in, 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 in Mickey D's. But my God, that, that ain't no money at all. Burger King. But then if you're selling drugs, see, you can have a wad of money in your pocket but don't know what to do with it. See, John Fitzgerald Kennedy's father knew what to do with money. He was a bootlegger. Don't nobody say, oh, his father was a criminal, he was a bootlegger. Oh, they talk about John. Big John, Bobby, Teddy, but everything they got came from criminal activity, but heavy businessman. And he parlayed criminal activity and got a son that was two sons as a senator and one as a president. That's what you call doing business. But now what did you do with your bootlegging? Crack cocaine, reefer. You know what you did? You got 10, 15 years in prison and now you just a slave on the white man's plantation in prison. You came from the ghetto plantation, now you in prison plantation. Plus, you fighting each other over territory. We the four corner hustlers. Okay. What are the four corners? That one over there, that one over here, that one over here. We control this. Hey man, you under man that controlling the whole world. And you just controlling a few corners? Well, we got to study this white man a little closer, don't you think? Did you know that it would be no exaggeration? This came out of a Jewish publication to say the greatest wealth and enterprise in South Africa are to be found in the German Jewish Hebrew community. That's in South Africa. They run the show. See, Mandela, he's a good man, but he couldn't fulfill any promise that he made to his little brothers that he was going to end this shanty town, build all these houses, put electricity here, because black folk can't do nothing without white help and support. Talk to me. So the white man don't mind making you a politician, because he's going to control you. Did I say something wrong? Every black leader that spoke of economic development was charged with being an anti-Semite. Would you like to get the list of all the black people that were called anti-Semitic? You would? Let me read their names off, see if you know any of them. It might be, you might know them all. Oh Lord, I gotta find it, I got it here. And you know, when you got so much to say, it's difficult, you know. Brothers in the, in the booth, you all help me if you got it. Uh, I'm gonna call these names because they're very important for you to know who's the anti-Semite. Okay, oh here they are, here they are. This is a list of respected blacks who have been victimized by being called black anti-Semites. And it spans the religious and political spectrum. We'll start first. It ain't your fault, Rock, it's just, <laughs> I'm just preaching long. 
But that's why I only come out maybe once every few months, because you couldn't take me every week. <laughs> but what I say when I come out, if you take it home and break it down, you got enough wisdom to keep you going for a long time. <laughs> now, look at this. Look at this. We'll start with Elijah Muhammad. That man never said one negative word about Jewish people. You know what he did say? We need to have an economic program. That made him anti-Semitic. Because if you're going to have some black economics, somebody going out of business. And when you have black men and women teaching that we should buy from our own, support our own, well, when you buy from your own, support your own, in the days when the Jews had businesses all in our community, you'd be taking money from them. Now you'd be taking it from Arabs, Koreans, and others. Everybody getting fat off of us. But guess what? Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey. Maybe you don't know them. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X. Before I became the leading black anti-Semite, did you know that Brother Malcolm had the title? He, he was one of my teachers. Julian Bond, Kwame Toure, Stokely Carmichael, Andrew Young, former president of, of the uh, NAACP, Kwesi and Fume, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Joseph Lowry, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Black Panthers were called anti-Semitic yesterday, and the, Black, the new Black Panther Party is called anti-Semitic today. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, Brother Marcus Garvey's movement, they were called anti-Semitic, Nation of Islam, but now let's go overseas, Mahatma Gandhi. Yes! Nelson Mandela, Bishop Desmond Tutu. I'm, 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 I'm in a good list of top people here. <laughs> Scholars, John Hope Franklin, J.A. Rogers, James Baldwin, Richard Wright, Julius Lester, Alice Walker, among entertainers, Michael Jackson, Spike Lee, Ice Cube, Arsenio Hall, Muhammad Ali, Public Enemy, and they even call Oprah. 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 Now, you see, whenever a black person looks like they're going to step out of line a little bit, hit them with that anti-Semitism. They get right back in line. But guess what? They didn't stop there. Harry Truman, president. John F. Kennedy. Richard Nixon. Jimmy Carter. Gerald Ford. George H.W. Bush. And now they call our dear, beloved brother, Barack Obama, an anti-Semite. Now what the hell does he have in common with me? I'm on the bottom rung of the anti-Semite ladder. He's at the top. Well, who the hell else is in between? That's you.
my God. I mean, are all of us anti-Semitic? That's why we are ready to go before the world and show that they're not. There are Semitic Jews. Yes, there are Semitic Jews. The Sephardim. They're Semitic Jews. The Philashas. They're Semitic Jews. But the Ashkenazi are European Jews. And guess what? Two weeks ago, I read in the paper that the Ashkenazi Jews had a school and the Sephardic Jews wanted to educate their children in that school and this Ashkenazi Jews said no, they will not go to school with a Sephardic Jew. See, these are the real anti-Semites now. Oh, I'm a little, a little bit more. Did you know that Martin Luther King had a little Jewish problem? No, not our brother. Yeah, quoting him. When we were working in Chicago, we had numerous rent strikes on the west side. And it was unfortunately true that in most instances, the persons we had to conduct these strikes against were Jewish landlords. We were living in a slum apartment owned by a Jew and a number of others, and we had to have a rent strike. We were paying $94 for four rundown shabby rooms. And we would go out on our open housing marches on Gage Park and other places, and we discovered that whites with five sanitary, nice, new rooms, apartments with five rooms, were paying only $78 a month. We were paying 20% tax. The Negro ends up paying a color tax, and this has happened in instances where Negroes actually confronted Jews as the landlord or the storekeeper. So you can imagine when he said something like this, he was an anti-Semite. And you notice, a man wrote me this week after the, this, the uh, story came out. He said, Farrakhan, you say we owe you? We don't owe you nothing. You owe us. He said, I'm sending you the bill for us Jews that started the NAACP and the money that we spent organizing you people's marches for justice and jobs, which you don't have now and never did have. Damn, I mean, look at that guard. He gonna send me the bill. Y'all all right? <laughs> This is serious. They started the NAACP. Oh, let me see what Brother Malcolm said about them. Well, I know I saw it in here. Oh, yeah. Where, where's Malcolm? Oh, Brother Malcolm, come to the front. Talk to us. Yeah, here's Brother. Did you know that the Jews that set up the NAACP, Julius Rosenthal, Lillian Wald, Rabbi Emil G. Hirsch, Rabbi Stephen Wise, and the chairman was Joel Spingon. And Spingon was the author of an anti-economic philanthropy specifically designed for black causes. Spingon said that the policy of the NAACP would be non-economic liberalism. So that's why the NAACP has never started a big business. Because the Jews finance it. And you can fight, you know, no, you hear, but here's the way you Negroes got to fight. You fight for the right to vote. You fight to desegregate the lunch counters, the hotels, so we can have access to money that we didn't have access to under segregation. So break down the bars. Come on, Negroes. 
come on and march. Sit in, kneel in, wade in. Come on, Negroes. So now you can go to the Marriott, but who owns it? You can go to the Hilton. You can go to the fine restaurants, but who owns it? You can go to the supper clubs, but who owns it? See, you have been broken as a people by a smart, crooked deceiver. Look at what Brother Malcolm said. Let me just say a word about the Jews and the black man. The Jew is always anxious to advise the black man, but he never advises him how to solve the problem the way the Jews solve their problem. Y'all love Brother Malcolm? Listen, listen to your brother. The Jew never went sitting in crawling in, sliding in, freedom riding, like he teaches and helps Negroes to do. The Jews stood up, the Jews stood together, and they used their ultimate power, the economic weapon. That's exactly what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is trying to teach black men to do. This is Malcolm talking before he left the nation. The Jews pooled their money and bought hotels that barred them. They bought Atlantic City. They bought Miami Beach and anything else they wanted. Who owns Hollywood? Who runs the garment industry? The largest industry in New York City. But the Jew that's advising the Negro tells him, join the NAACP, CORE, the Urban League, and others. And with money donation, the Jew gains control. Yes, then he sends the black man doing all this wading in, boring in, even burying in. Everything but buying in. Never shows him how to set up factories and hotels. Never advises him how to own what he wants. No, when there's something worth owning, the Jews have it. That's Malcolm X. Now, now, wait. They handed me the bill. For all you Negro marchers. You remember the march in 1963? Where Martin Luther King made his famous speech? Do you know who financed it? These people. Do you know the 19, the, uh, let me see, 63, the 1983 march? Do you know who financed it? Jews. So when we were there, they didn't want me to speak. But Brother Leonard met a Jewish rabbi. Told him, look, you better let my people go. Farrakhan gonna speak tonight. And they were trying to pull my coat to get me down because they only gave me one minute. I don't even know what one minute looked like. But guess what? I spoke for six minutes. The shortest speech I ever made. And the next day in the Washington Post, they compared that speech with the speech that Martin Luther King made 20 years earlier. And then they said, well, you got to pay for Andrew Goodman and Schwerner, these two Jews that died for you people. You ever notice how when they want to tell you how they suffered, they will always bring up Andrew Goodman and Schwerner? Well, let me tell you what Goodman said. Listen to Goodman. Quote, it is true that the white man, and by this I mean Christian civilization in general, has proved himself to be the most depraved devil imaginable in his attitude toward the Negro race. This is what Andrew Goodman said. The source and cause of this need for reaction can be attributed to white contempt and neglect. 
The historical contempt that the white race held for the Negroes has created a group of rootless, degraded people. That's you. The current neglect of the problem can only irritate this deplorable state of affairs. The black Muslims should constitute a warning to our society, a warning that must be heeded if we are to preserve the society. The road to freedom must be uphill, even if it is arduous and frustrating. A people must have dignity and identity. If they can't do it peacefully, they will do it defensively. Now, this is Andrew Goodman. He wasn't raised as a Jew. Neither was Schwerner. Guess what? They were raised as secular humanists. Now, how many of you are socialists? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> how many of you are communists? How many of you are capitalists? The Jews gave those philosophies <laughs> to the world. Secular humanism was started by Jews. So wherever you think you're going in philosophy, they went there ahead of you and fixed it. Oh, bless your heart with your degrees and you really think you're going to have a job. Poor soul. That's all over. They let you go. And God has come to claim you for his own. In conclusion, and I mean it. <laughs> and I mean it. In, in conclusion, See, the Jews planned and executed the Federal Reserve System. In 1910, Senator Nelson Aldrich and some of the country's leading financiers who represented about one-fourth of the world's wealth arrived at the Jekyll Island Club to create the Federal Reserve. They took over the printing of money. And you think when it says Federal Reserve that that's the government. No, it's a group of international bankers who control the printing of money and bonds. How does that affect your wallet right now? How does that affect your wallet? We, we're closing, we're closing. Guess what? I have a record here. You know, the Federal Reserve became law in 1913. In 1913, I have it here, the income of America was seven hundred and fourteen million four hundred and sixty three thousand and they outlaid seven hundred and fourteen eight hundred sixty four thousand so they had a negative deficit of four hundred and one thousand dollars and the deficit from 1906 to 1913, this is what America owed, 1 billion, 193 million, 48,000 dollars. That's what this great nation owed less than 100 years ago. 100 years later, since the Federal Reserve has been in office over 13 and a half trillion dollars so you see guess what see you was the sharecropper you never got finished paying so you had to stay on the plantation <laughs> America's in that shape right now she cannot pay 
the interest on her debt. She is not paying down the principal. Who got her? The international bankers, the synagogue of Satan. America's sovereignty is all but destroyed because they want one world where they control the wealth of all the nations of the earth and they've almost done it. But a few weeks ago, Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former uh, security man under, which president was it? Jimmy Carter. He was talking to the Council of Foreign Relations and he told them our one world strategy is finished. He was talking about the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, Skull and Bones, the Masons, all these secret societies. Why is our world coming down? Because the masses all over the world are awakening. Respite me till the day when they are raised and now his world is coming down. I want to close with basketball. Since LeBron was in the news, have you ever seen such a clamor over our brothers? Did you hear how the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers talked about poor brother like he betrayed Cleveland by moving somewhere else? But guess what? We did the research. Let's look at who the commissioners of sports are. Who's still on the plantation? Let me show you. David Stern, Jewish, National Basketball Association Commissioner. Maurice Podoloff, the first president of the NBA. Bud Selig, Major League Basket Baseball Commissioner. Gary Bettman, National Hockey League Commissioner. Mark Cohan, Canada, Canadian Football League Commissioner. Don Garber, Major League Soccer Commissioner. Sidney Halter, the first commissioner of the Canadian football field. Now, Leslie Alexander, Jewish, owns the Houston Rockets. Mickey Arison is the owner of the Miami Heat. Miami Heat. Is that where LeBron is? Is that where Dwayne Wade is? Is that where Rosh is? Rosh is? Larry Brown was a U.S. basketball coach, but Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, he's Jewish. Alan Cohen, former co-owner of the Boston Celtics and the New Jersey Nets, the New York Knicks, and the New York Rangers. William Davidson, principal owner of the Detroit Pistons of the NBA, the Detroit Shark of the WNBA, Dan Gilbert, owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now listen. You know, there's some plantations if you go to, they treat you better. But our brother went from one plantation owner who is Jewish to another plantation owner who is Jewish. And the Jewish owner in Miami was jumping up and down because these Negroes sitting here like they are the top stars. But in the background is the dude 
They're saying, boy, we're going to get $750 million coming in because of these three Negroes. Put their meat on a plantation. So Mr. Gilbert is hot with Mickey Arison. And guess what? They went for less money. Because see, black folk today can't be bought all the way out with money. They want a championship ring. Oh, oh, a ring. Oh. Damn. Now look, look at you. Boy, you the craziest people. But God said he would choose a foolish people, and we certainly fit the bill, don't we? Look at all of us out there with bling bling, right? Come on. I got my bling, you got your bling, right? And we out blinging one another. Who you blinging from? Who's the diamond merchant? Who's the gold merchant? Who is running Johannesburg and the gold mines and Kimberly and the diamond mine? Talk to me! That's why in the name jewelry is the name Jew. Because they run the industry. Oh, you can get it at K's. They got you coming and going. Not only you, they got us. Wait now. Renan Katz from Israel, he's part owner of the Miami Heat. Herbert Cole, owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. Jimmy Krause, Jerry Krause, general manager of the Chicago Bulls. Jerry Reinsdorf, owner of the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago White Sox. A. Pollen, owner of WNBA's Washington Mystics. Bruce Ratner, owner of the New Jersey Nets. Howard Schultz. U.S. owner of Seattle Supersonics and the founder of Starbucks. Larry Tannenbaum, owner of the Toronto Raptors. Brett Yormark, president and CEO of the New Jersey Nets. Now look, see, you strong, strapping Negroes. You Negroes that are good for sport. The Quran said his world is sport and play. And every time you play, he gets rich. Every time you sport, he gets rich. He owns football. Arthur Blank owner of the Atlanta Falcons, Steve Bornstein, president and CEO of the National Football League Network, Norman Brayman, former, former owner of the Philadelphia Eagles. We could just go on down the list to show you that you, you're on a plantation, brother. And when your days of playing are over, what's your condition? What's your condition? What's their condition? Did you know that top rank was started by Muslims? John Ali and Jabir Muhammad with Bob Arum started top rank. John Ali don't have no more. Jabir Muhammad don't have it anymore. But Bob Arum, the Jewish guy, got the whole thing. Every black man today that's rich, he has friendship with a Jewish person. And it's that friendship that has made Jay-Z, P. Diddy, has made um, Russell Simmons, Beyonce, all our people got plenty of money. Oprah, plenty of money.
but they have never learned how to network their money to produce real wealth for our people. So all the friendship that they have that makes them rich was never good enough to make us rich as a people. And so, beloved, in delivering this message, I know it may bring hurt to me and to us, but I also know that we will have the victory. The Jewish people have the force to hurt, and they also have what it takes to help. I've asked them, since your people put ours in this condition, why don't you help me raise our people up from the degraded state that your people have put them in? Do you think I'm wrong to ask them? I'm not asking them for a check to give to silly people. They're going to give it right back to them. I don't know where the Koreans are getting hair from. But they sure corn, corn, uh, cornered the market on hair. And if you want hair, you have to go see the Koreans today. If you want nails, want your toes made pretty, as though there's no black person that got that skill nowhere. There was a black person that owned a beauty supply place. They had to go out of business because the only place they could buy the beauty su supplies was from the Koreans. The Koreans sold them their beauty supplies at a high price and sold their brethren the same beauty supplies at a very low price, and the black businessman could not compete. So I thank you for listening. And I hope that you'll get the book and see how you are being exploited, how Hollywood has painted you in a stupid way. We are the clowns. We are the still step and fetch it, still the same. We're doing. Well, they sent me a note. Jerry Krause is the former general manager for the Chicago Bulls. Yes, but who's the owner? Mr. Reinsdorf. So one man puts his brother in a spot. See, you don't do that for your brother. You don't make a way for your people. Can we do better? Shouldn't we do better? Shouldn't we study how successful the Jewish people are and then set out to become successful ourselves? Yes, sir. Do you think that this message today was a message of hate? No, sir. No, sir. no really, really, I want you to answer me. If I'd like a nice... Um, Sandwich, that, you know, Reuben sandwich. You know, Reuben was one of the 12 tribes, I guess, of the Jews. But a Reuben sandwich, you know, you got to go to Manny's or some Jewish person. And you can't fault the Jew for doing business. Fault yourself for not doing this yourself. I took some of my sons on the street, um, What's the name of that street 
where the clo clothing? Roosevelt Avenue. <clears throat> you want a sandwich, you go around the corner to Manny's. You want to buy a suit, you go around the corner to his Jewish brother. And when you go to the Jewish brother, if you got a problem, you want a divorce, he'll send you to a Jewish lawyer. And if you go there coughing and spitting, he'll send you to a Jewish doctor. And if you need a hearing aid, they'll send you to another Jew who will help you with your hearing aid. See, they got this thing locked down, but they know how to network. Come on, brothers and sisters. You want to establish a little business for yourself. You don't know how to take six of you or eight of you with a common purpose, trusting one another, pooling your resources, and serving your people. You can do it, and you're going to be forced to do it. Thank you for listening. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That means God is the greatest. Let's put our hands together for our beloved minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you. How many of you are here for your first time? Never been before. Let me see your hands. Thank you for coming and thank those of you who invited them. Those of you who are here for the first time, how many of you believe that what you heard taught today, that it is the truth and is good for black people? Let me see your hands. And the last question I'm going to ask, if you believe it's true and is good for us as a people, how many of you are willing to unite on the side of truth and help us to raise our people from this condition and become a part of the nation of Islam? How many of you are ready to do that? Would you raise your hands real high? Don't be bashful. Let me hear, let me see. Okay. Would you please be seated? I would like to shake the hand. No, 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 please, wait, wait, wait. I want to shake the hand of all those who want to become a part of this truth and help us. I, I, I don't have the strength after teaching so long to shake hands with everybody who might want to shake my hand. I want to shake your hand too, but I, to, this time I just want to shake the hand of those who want to become a part of this. Are there those downstairs in the masala? Yes, sir. And there are those in the gymnasium? Well, those of you who are downstairs in the masala, those of you who are over in the gymnasium, why don't you start making your way right over here and let me get a chance to shake your hand. And all the sisters, why don't you come down? All the brothers, why don't you come down and let me have the privilege of shaking your hand. Just come right out to the center aisle. Those who would like to unite on the side of truth and be a part of the nation of Islam, Please make your way down the center aisle, those brothers and sisters who would like to become a part of the nation of Islam and help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan that are down in the lower sanctuary and over in the school. Make your way over to Mas Maryam that you may have the honor of shaking the hand of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah. Again, we want just those that want to become a part of the nation of Islam that would like to unite and help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to change the ugly condition under which we live and suffer as a people. As our sisters make their way down the center aisle and our brothers also are preparing, we want to let you know that today's message is available on DVD as well as available on CD 
and is being high speed duplicated as we speak and will be available next door at Muhammad University of Islam. Please purchase your copy of today's message on, uh, available on DVD or CD audio. Again, those brothers who are in the line, we hope, we ask that all of those that are next door as well as in the lower level of Mas Maryam, that they would make their way now to shake the hand of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praises due to Allah. The book, The Secret Relationships Between Black and Jews is available volume two, and also volume one is available. Please get your copy before you leave today. We also, I mentioned one and two. Is that it? All praises due to Allah. <laughs> We'd like, as the minister continues to shake the hand of those who are accepting the message today to become a part of the Nation of Islam, we are asking everyone's support of our school, Muhammad University of Islam, this Saturday, July 17th, 5 p.m. from Dusabu Museum. Our Parent Teachers Association will be putting on a silent auction that will help to raise much needed funds to continue our education at Muhammad University of Islam. Please support Muhammad University of Islam at this weekend's uh, silent auction at Dusabu Museum. Again, that is at 5 p.m. this uh, Saturday, July 17th. our brothers from Somalia in uh, Africa and uh, they represent the president of Somalia whom I met last year in Libya and he's now in Minneapolis you said and soon God willing inshallah we'll meet here and have that talk may Allah bless you All praises due to Allah. Once again, let's put our hands together. We can do better than that, Mas Mariam. We have been thoroughly, thoroughly fed, taught, educated, inspired, motivated. 
the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. You may remain standing that we can close our program with prayer, reminding everyone again to not leave without getting your personal copy of today's message and also a copy of the two books, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 1, Volume 2. But I also want to welcome and acknowledge the mother of one of our great, great student ministers in the Nation of Islam, Brother Nuri Muhammad, his mother, Mrs. McGee, McNee, right? McNee, where is she? Where's mom? All right, well, let's give her a warm round of applause. She came. Her first time here at Mas Maniam to hear Minister Farrakhan, and also a mother of a dearly beloved sister who we um, who passed um, maybe I think I can't remember the month just a few weeks ago, and that's Sister Angela Muhammad from Mas Number Two uh, B on the West Side, and she's here with us visiting us, and we wanted to just acknowledge her presence and to thank her for her wonderful and beautiful daughter that she brought into the world and may Allah's peace and blessings be forever upon you and your family. And let us keep Brother Elliot Muhammad in our prayers as he is struggling, as many of us know, uh, with cancer, but the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Let us keep all of our brothers and sisters who are struggling with health issues in our prayers. And now with that said, I think we can close this wonderful afternoon with prayer. Please join me. Hold this. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the world, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the day of requital, thee do we serve in thine aid we seek. O Allah, guide us on the right path the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom your wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard thy teachings. Say he, Allah is one. Allah is he on whom we all depend. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Amin. May the peace and blessings of Allah go with you. Remember to do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Greet your brother and sister as you leave.